Welcome tonight to the final night of our virtual hunt series for the springtime. Wrapped up the last couple nights with turkey hunting. Tonight we've actually got a special guest. The man of the hour is Vincent Hancock. He's, uh, his resume is just absolutely stacked with the, all the wins he's got. He's a multiple-time world champion. He's a back-to-back -back gold medal Olympic champion, which is pretty cool. Uh, his, his discipline right now is with Skeet. Obviously, I know some of the questions coming in already on the on the screens, not only about the skeet, but it's also about other types of shooting. So, Vincent, be ready for that. Uh, we want to make sure we thank our sponsors tonight. We've got USA Clay, Beretta, and Shields Outfitters, uh, the main primary sponsors for this evening. So we appreciate everybody for sponsoring that. And we've got an awesome prize package tonight, which includes a shotgun from Beretta, which I'm very jealous I do not qualify for or eligible for this. However, of one lucky winner out there, make sure you're getting registered at uh, shields.com slash hunt series. And uh, make sure you guys are checking that. Make sure you get, you're getting registered on it. Again, this is a fantastic prize package this evening at Shotgun, Shields out for clothing, some other items too. It's going to be fantastic. So let's go ahead and get into some of the, uh, the introductions here. My name is Ben Fleischacker. Again, I apologize for not saying that earlier. Uh, currently right now, I help with our Shields Outfitter and Shields products. And uh, Got some pretty cool stuff coming out this fall, so please make sure you're paying attention to our website and uh, some of the commercials and magazine articles, so it's going to be pretty cool. But man of the hour tonight, Vincent Hancock, welcome. Thank you for taking your time this evening. I know you're down in Texas, uh, enjoying the warm weather, hopefully not too windy and hopefully no snow down there again. But uh, if you don't mind, go yeah, ahead we, and kind of give yourself an introduction here. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of, of this event that's going on. Um, my name is Vincent Hancock. I've been a competitive shooter for about 22 years now. I just turned 32, so I started this when I was 10. And I found the Olympic discipline when I was 12 years old. I'm originally from Georgia, but as all of my friends out here in Texas like to say, I got to Texas as fast as I could. <laughs> well, we've been out here now for about seven years, and we love it out here. We're in Fort Worth, Texas, so we're on kind of the west side of the DFW Metroplex and met some really great people out here and get to shoot pretty much year round. So that's another great thing with the weather. However, uh, as if, if anybody's been watching the news, you've seen the snow apocalypse. We lived through it. Um, you know, the, the four inches of snow that crippled us for a week and a half, you guys don't even think twice about up North, nope. but <laughs> you know, we got it. We're, we're through it. And next week, I think we're supposed to hit in the nineties. Wow. Um, weather in, in Fort Worth and Texas in general changes on a dime and we've been having 30 mile an hour winds for the last few weeks but thankfully today was the first day that it was under 10 miles an hour and it was great to practice in I can tell you yeah that's got to throw some curveballs too I mean shooting in that wind I mean it's something that you know the general public I would say that now are not doing the competition shooting I mean if we just go out and shoot over the weekend I mean it is what it is but in your situation I mean be able to practice in every single situation variety of climate wind, temperature, humidity, all that probably plays a factor. Oh, absolutely. Now, that's the, one of the things that, that's been nice about since I've been out here. I don't think twice about wind. Uh, we are, uh, Fort Worth Trap and Skeet, which is on the southwest side of town, is up on kind of one of the highest points on the west side. So we get all the wind. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, like, it was uh, 2018 in Malta. I was competing, and it was probably 25 to 30 mile an hour sustained winds with some gusts as well. And I shot a 124 out of 125, and people were just like, what's going on? I'm like, this is normal. This is a normal day for me at home. So the wind doesn't bother me that much. Yep. And like you said, the, the variety of conditions we have to compete in, mm -hmm. and I've shot in a blizzard in China. I've shot in a hurricane in Georgia. I've shot in sleet, rain, wind, I mean, you name it, uh, 100 and something degrees in China at the Olympics in Beijing in, in 08. So mm -hmm. yeah, we've gone through all of it. We're an outdoor event. We're a summer event, so we get to, to have it all. Yep, that's pretty cool. All right, the first question, this is actually a question internally here. But what was it like to represent the United States in the Olympics? Multiple times, obviously. It's, you know, it's hard to, to put into words exactly what that means. Obviously, it's a, it's a culmination of dreams. Mm -hmm. It truly is. This is what I, I wanted to do from the time I, I found out that I had a chance at going to the Olympics and shooting. And... Everybody always says, you know, is, is the best. It's, they're asking me a question, but they're also trying to tell me. They're like, wasn't getting the gold medal hung around your neck just the best feeling ever? It, it was great, and it was a, a dream come true for me. But when I look back on it, especially as I've gotten older, 
the best part about the Olympics was walking into opening ceremonies. And the reason for that is because I got to be a part of the whole team, mm -hmm. 600 athletes that are all there representing the United States, the greatest country in the world on the greatest sporting stage in the world being watched by billions of people. Yeah, there's nothing like that. And we get to, they, they announce our countries that the story that I like to tell is when we walked into Beijing, we're in the, in the little corridor about to go into the stadium and it's pitch black inside. But you can see, you can hear the, the fans outside. You can see the lights. And then as they call United States, the, the flag, just like as it hits the, hits the light from the stadium, it just bursts into colors and the, the stadium goes nuts. I mean, it's deafening. You can't even hear yourself think or talk to the next person. The athletes are jumping up and down. They're screaming. They're yelling. They're chanting USA. The whole crowd is chanting that. Uh, there's, I have never experienced anything like that again in my life. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And that's something that, I mean, we got, we kind of have to live through you to experience, you know. So I appreciate you guys telling us that, you know. Um, so jumping into some of these questions, we do have quite a few coming through. And uh, at any time, Vincent, if you got some other ideas too, because one thing that we're going to see is that a lot of our area – uh, in the upper, you know, the rural areas. I mean, a lot of our Blue Rock, I call it Blue Rock. I mean, that's horrible. I mean, that's what we grew up in Nebraska calling, you know, trap shooting, clay shooting, you know, the hand throwers, the little spring throwers. Obviously, skeet is a little bit different, but there's also sporting clays. You got trap, you know, different ranges, different shot, different shotguns. I mean, there's so many details to get into it. Um, some of the questions we're going to have are going to be very basic, very entry level, you know, coming from me most likely. And then we're going to have some of those advanced questions too, coming in for some of the tune in, people are tuning in. But on a general general week, how many rounds are you guys shooting? It depends on what stage of development you are. Now, for me right now, I'm averaging probably about a thousand rounds a week, maybe a little bit more than that. And you know, some of my other athletes, because I coach as well, some of them are are closing in on that two thousand round a week oh, wow. range. Wow. You know, and and at some points in time, they're shooting three thousand rounds a week. Now, you can put a lot of rounds down range really quickly, especially when you're working on something, you know, chunk training, as we call it. And when I was a teenager, looking at it from a year perspective, when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, I was probably putting down about 75,000, 80,000 rounds a year. That's a lot of targets, a lot of shells. A lot of ammo, especially right now with the ammo shortage. Yeah, so I couldn't imagine trying to do it now. Yeah. Yeah, that's insane. What are you guys doing anything special for that? I mean, do you guys hand load? No. So thankfully, we've we've kind of had uh, the Team USA athletes that are on the Olympic team. We've been able to work because Federal is the the major sponsor of USA shooting, and they're also my sponsor as well. So thankfully, we had enough rounds made specifically for Team USA and for the other sponsored athletes that we've been able to be okay. But Good. And you know, that's because Federal was was on their you know, was on the ball and made sure that they had the stuff you know, in preparation leading up to Tokyo of last year. So we're kind of carrying over still. But some of my athletes are having to really scrounge around and find whatever they can get to be able to continue to practice. It's brutal. It's absolutely brutal <laughs> right now. All right. So when you're shooting on a daily basis, and obviously it's discipline specific on this one, but for your ski. How many different body positions do you put yourself into, or is it very consistent that when you when you step up to the stage and how you shoot, is it very consistent? I mean, and so it, yes, it's going to be very consistent, but it's also dependent on what station that you're that you're actually shooting. Yep. So in sport plays, every station is different, right? Mm -hmm. In ski, or I should say, in trap, there's five stations. Yep. But there's also a variance of targets. But again, you're going to position yourself in the same way. Mm -hmm. And in ski, we have eight stations. So there's going to be a different position for each one of those stations, but at the same time, you're going to structurally from the feet up, you're going to be the same. Now you have a high house and a low house on ski, which they cross over a central point. My targets are traveling about, uh, there's a lot of different numbers out there, but it, what we usually go with is about 65 miles per hour is what my targets are doing. The, the regular, that's the Olympic style. So the American version is doing about, 15 miles an hour less than that, maybe 10 miles an hour less, somewhere in that range. Again, numbers vary range to range, radar gun to radar gun, <laughs> but that's typically what we go. There is a significant difference in speed. You can put cool. it that way. Yeah, that is. And so uh, there's a lot of things that go into making sure that you can have the repeatability. Mm -hmm. 
is that's what takes you to the highest level you can get to is being able to do the same thing over and over and over again. It's kind of similar to like when you watch professional baseball players, when they're stepping up to an at bat, they do the same thing every single time. It's called a pre-shot routine. So it mine for me starts, uh, if I'm say there's six shooters, that's one of our squads and say I'm the third shooter. So mine starts on the first shooter. Now I'll start getting myself into a, a mental state of being prepared and then as that person steps off, shooter one steps off, then it goes to shooter two, and I get a little bit further into that zone. And then once shooter two is done and I'm preparing myself to step on the station, that's when everything kind of goes from a – If put it, to put it in perspective, it's like this is my focus, and it goes to here, then to here, and then when I step on the station, it's here. Mm -hmm. So it's really a tight focus. You're going through it. But again, you hit checklists. It's a process. So I make sure that my feet are positioned in the right way. My natural point of alignment is set up the right way. My hold points are right. My break points are right. My eyes are correct. All of this happens within seconds. Mm -hmm. But it's a process that's taken me you know, a couple decades now to really perfect and to know. And because and at the end of the day, a missed target's a missed target. And we have very little room for error. So we're trying to take out as much error as possible so that way we can have the best outcome and Repeatab repeatability is how you reduce the amount of error that's in play. Now, do you shoot the same choke tube for both barrels? No. So because we shoot with a 24 gram load mm -hmm. and we move all around the, the field in kind of a semicircle, that's what the, that's how the skeet field is set up. I shoot, uh, I'll tell you the chokes here in a second, but the first shot is typically closer than the second shot mm -hmm. on stations three, four, and five, which are in the middle of the field. And we can't change chokes when we're out there on the field. So you, ha you have to find a setup that really works for you. And so to kind of, people are going to think I'm crazy, but because we shoot a 24 gram load or a seven, eight ounce load, we have a lot fewer BBs than, than typically people will with American trap, American skeet, sporting clays. They'll shoot one ounce or an ounce and an eighth load. And there's a lot more pellets in there. So I shoot an improved cylinder on the bottom and a modified choke on the top. No kidding. And the reason being, and people, again, like I said, people think I'm crazy, but when you take it down to a patterning board and you shoot the chokes and I take a target down with me and I look and see in my choke, is there any hole oh. in that pattern at 19 meters? So about 20 to 21 yards. And on the first, first shot, on the second shot, it's about 22, 23 yards. Most people take the target like this and they'll put it on the plate and say, okay, well, there's a few BBs in there or there's a hole there as, a, as the target sitting flush up against it. The way that I look at it is my targets are on edge. So I take the target and I hold it on edge inside that pattern. And if I don't have multiple BBs on that target, then it's not going to break because the, the significant number that we come up with, and I'm not sure, I'm sure there's a lot more intelligent people out there than me that can give you the reason behind this. But we say that it takes at least three BBs to break a target. There's really no such thing as the golden BB. Mm -hmm. And with that, you need a, a pretty dense pattern. So shooting number nines, 24 gram, we just don't have a lot out there. So you have to condense that down to make sure that you don't have any holes. Because that way I know without a shadow of a doubt that if I miss the target, I missed it because I missed it. It wasn't because of anything else. Now, I get a lot of a lot of smoke off of targets because when I hit it, I hit it pretty hard. Yep. But I like to have the error on me so that way I know that I can reduce it and not have to worry about anything else. Yeah, and your equipment's good. There's no lack of confidence with your equipment. Exactly. Now, for the nine shot, do you guys shoot nine shot just because of the pattern density with the smaller pellets, or is there more science to it? No, that's that's the reason. We want as many BBs on target as possible yep. with the kinetic energy to still break it. Yep. So we have occasionally had to go down to like an eight and a half, sometimes overseas when we're competing, because our targets are a lower profile than what uh, standard targets are here in the U.S. that you're going to find. Mm -hmm. So they're a little bit denser and a little bit thicker because we have to throw them so much harder. Mm -hmm. So with that, it takes a little bit more energy to break the targets too. Then in our finals, we shoot what's called flash targets or puff targets. So it's the same target, but now you have a cup on the inside of it, typically on the bottom, that's holding in powder and it's glued to the bottom of it. So now you have a hard target that's now glued together. 
So it can be really hard to break without putting a lot of BBs on it or without having a lot of energy. And I have gone down to seven and a halves before shooting in those finals because the targets are like rocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see the paint being hit off of the targets and they just keep on going. You go down and look at a target and you've got eight or nine BB marks where it's just skipped off the target. And I'm like, well, there's nothing else I can do about that. Yep. And it just continued to go. So now what my theory is, is if it's hard, I'm still going to stick with no greater size than eight and a half. I'll, I'll, most of the time I just stick with nines because I can put more BBs on it. And I want as many BB sections in that target as possible. Absolutely. All right. So one of the questions, this is a good one. Hopefully good for a coach too to answer. Okay, so I have a cross-eyed dominance, right hand, right-handed, left eye dominant. There's so much conflicting advice out there with dealing with this. What is your advice? It depends. It all depends on the person. Yep. It really does. The, the the way that we typically look at it is if you're left eye dominant and you're just starting out, and if you can do anything left-handed, I'm not. I I can't do anything left-handed. So I have to if doesn't matter. I can't even think about going over. But if you can hold a gun and shoot it left-handed and it doesn't feel completely abnormal, do that. Mm -hmm. Because now you don't have to worry about anything and you don't have to have any type of occlusion, meaning blocking part of your vision and that having that take away from what you can see. Now, if that's out of the question, you can't do that. What I do typically with, with the majority of my students at the beginning is I'll just take some chapstick and I'll have them obviously with an empty empty barrel, close the gun, mount the gun, and uh, line their eye up down the barrel. And I'll get down the end of the barrel and I'll look down it. And what I'll do is I'll take some chapstick and I'll cover up their left eye. If, if, again, if you're right-handed, cover up just enough of their left eye that they can't see the end of the barrel. And what happens is, is when you have that, then the left eye can't take over control of the barrel. Mm -hmm. So then the left, that barrel won't come into play again because you know, when we're looking down the gun, you're going to see two barrels. It's just which one does your eye take into first because that's the dominant eye. So if your left eye is taking over, then it's going to be the wrong barrel that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So if you can take that completely out, you won't have that issue. Now, a lot of people like to, to tape over top of it and put a lot of occlusion there. I don't like that. I want as much peripheral vision as possible because the more vision and clarity you have, the more likely you are to see the target better, to slow the target down, to hold the target, meaning when you get there, you see it clear, you don't just pull the trigger immediately, you actually see the bird barrel relationship and that will lead to more consistent hits as well and a better sight picture for your subconscious to understand and be able to repeat again. That's Again, that's the, what we're coming back to is repeatability. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do. Very good. Hopefully that answered that question out there. And that's one and, thing that... And I'll say one thing. If you can get this, the little tiny circle of, of tape that's just got... They make different levels of occlusion mm -hmm. tape. I find the, the clearest thing that you, can, that you can just not see through. Just as long as it obscures it a little bit. Now, that's what I, I do for permanent uh, solutions is I just put that little piece of tape on there. You can even do scotch tape if you want. And it can be almost completely clear. Yep. Just as long as it's not as clear as your right eye, then you're fine. That's really cool. I think going back to even your first the first answer you gave, if you can switch your shooting, you should do that early, right? I mean, hopefully. I've got man, several students that are that way. Yeah, you know, and growing up, I mean, you know, and, and bless my family. But I may be left eye dominant. I may be right eye dominant. It doesn't matter. Here's a right hand shotgun. Shoot it. Figure it out, right? I mean, that's just how yeah. a lot of us, I think, are probably growing up. So it's good. It's good information. All right. So let's see here. Question. So is there a reason why you guys shoot over and unders? Is that by, by a rule? Uh, in the Olympics, it's not necessarily a rule. You can shoot a semi-auto, but you cannot shoot a pump. And the semi-autos for us, they don't cycle consistently enough. Hmm. And we have an allotment for one malfunction. And if you have the second malfunction, you're starting to lose targets. Uh, I may be misquoting. Maybe we're allowed two now. Uh, they've changed that. But anyways, we can't have many malfunctions. So we can't afford that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, too, is that I shoot my pairs too fast. That up until just a few years ago with some of the faster cycling guns, I would trap the trigger every time. It wouldn't cycle fast enough. It's pretty fast. So it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I trapped it quite a few times. 
before I, I proved to people like, yeah, look, I can't shoot this gun anymore. It has to be an over and under. Yep. But you know, it's just more consistent that way. Plus the, the two different chokes, mm-hmm. you know, I spent, I mean, into playing bunker trap, you need different chokes because the first shot you're looking at about 35 yards, 37, the second shot you're looking at 45 plus. And that's a, a pretty big variation, but those targets are going even faster than mine. And now with skeet again, you want to have two different chokes because that first target's going to be pretty consistent within 20 yards, but the second target can get as far as 37 yards on our reverse pairs on stations three and five. So you need to be able to reach out and touch with it with a good dense pattern. Do you mess around with light modified at all? I have, and that's what I recommend to everybody else to shoot. But what I had available to me at, t- at the time when the gun came was a modified choke, and I took, took it down, and mine patterned perfectly. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to shoot that for a little bit. When I started shooting really well with the gun when I picked it up in 2017 and won everything with it, so I'm like, okay, I'm not going to change. I'm just going to leave it like it is. It ain't broke. <laughs> exactly. All right. So on your practice days, how does it differ from your competition days? Are you still shooting on your competition days to get warmed up? Or is it, does it look totally different? Yeah, so in our competition days, we, we're not allowed any practice at wow. all. Okay. We, we travel overseas to shoot five competition rounds over the course of two days. And so it'll take me longer to travel than, back and forth than it will be for me to compete while I'm there. And as far as practice goes, so like at home in practice, I'll shoot anywhere from six boxes of shells a day to ten boxes of shells a day. And... I'll put in, usually what I do is I shoot, like starting on a Monday. Monday I'll shoot three rounds and then a a portion of a final, which our finals are 60 targets on only stations three, four, and five. And they also include reverse pairs on three and five. Getting a little bit technical there, but bear with me. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I'll go into my station training, which I, I typically incorporate into just being 24 or 25 or 26 shells. That's kind of the, the three numbers that my station trainings go into. And then if I need additional training as well, if I feel like it, then I'll go and do chunk training where I just stand on one station and I shoot the target until I feel comfortable with my move, with my placement, with everything. I diagnose, I understand, and I fix. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to kind of be in that corrective mode and then I'll finish for the day and then come back out and say on now on Tuesday, I'll shoot two rounds because, again, if you think three rounds the first day, two rounds the next day, that's typical course of fire for our competitions, 125 shells, Mm -hmm. 125 shots. And I'm always keeping score on those rounds. So I'm always trying to shoot 125 straight. I don't always get there, but that's my goal every time I step on the field. And then on that 50-day, I'll shoot a full 60-target final, not a shortened one. And then, again, at the end of that, I'll go into my station training. I'll go into my chunk training. And I'll just continually try to develop myself to, to be better on every anything. Even if I'm not having any issues, I haven't missed a target all day long, I'll still go out and shoot some of those things to try to make sure that if I had a bad move or a bad mount throughout the course of the day, I'm going back there and I'm making sure that my body knows exactly what to do, what perfect looks like. Do you do any and place training? What's that? Sorry? Place, placement training? Like you're just, I mean, in the bedroom right there, you got... Your shotgun, do you ever just sit there and mount and practice? I've done more practice mounts than I've shot targets. Uh, I've shot over a million targets, and I've done it at very minimum, at least a million practice mounts. When I was a teenager, I would do them. I would do 100 in the morning before I went to school. I'd go to school. I'd go shoot at the range. I'd come back home, do school, eat dinner, do another 100 practice mounts. And I would do that every single day, even on the weekends. So it's, it's all added up. I don't do them as often anymore, but... I still do them pretty regularly. That's awesome. Now, do you do much hunting then? Bird hunting at all? Uh, I used to, and I do when I get the chance. Yeah. And so growing up in Georgia, we were quail hunters, mm-hmm. and I had I had bird dogs that my dad and I trained together. Uh, I, I love quail hunting. And I, I do some dove hunting whenever I get a chance, but not too terribly often. And now what I've gotten into as far as uh, birds is waterfowl. I am addicted to duck hunting. Uh, I've been doing that for about – four years now and I've got got a dog, I've got decoys, I've got calls, I've got guns, I've got shells, you name it, I've got it. Well that's and pretty I, similar to skeet. Yeah. I mean they're coming to you, right? Yep. Yep. 
We, uh, you know, I found that ducks are probably the most challenging thing that I have ever tried to hunt before. Now, there's, I'll miss occasionally on quail, I'll miss occasionally on dove, not too terribly often, mm -hmm. but ducks, that's the one thing where I will shoot three times and a bird just keeps on flying. <laughs> and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. It's so it's, it's a challenge for me. And that's, that's what really drives me to want to do it yep. because it is to me the most challenging animal you can hunt as far as a shooting perspective. A steel shot doesn't help. The different velocities probably don't help either. Yes. That's the steel shot is maddening. Yeah. Uh, I will say that I have been trying out the bismuth and the tungsten. Oh yeah. So the mineral TSS, the black cloud TSS, yep. that is a phenomenal load. I, my, my shots now, my hits and actual kills have gone from, uh, I don't want, I don't know what the number would be. Just say a two to one, two shells to one bird mm -hmm. to now I'm down to probably one and a quarter, maybe, maybe one and a half at the most. Yep. But I don't, I don't lose birds anymore. That's, That's the nice thing. I know that I hit them with the steel, but they just keep on going Yep. with Winston, No, they, they go down. Oh yeah. Bismuth and TSS is a game changer. I mean, Bismuth has been around for a long time. So has TSS, but really got popular the last probably what, five, six years or so. But man, that stuff, that federal made, I, I shoot it for pheasants on the public land out here on the waterfowl production areas. And it's just a game changer. I mean, that stuff hits so good. But yeah, I, it does. So I, I'm glad to hear that you still bird hunt. That's good. Those Georgia, those Georgia quail yeah. hunts. I mean, I hear a lot of stories. Someday I will be down there with my pointers to, to run them on, on those quail down there. I can't wait. All right, so posture tips on shooting across your body. So, and this one could be also not only from, from your discipline, but also from the hunting perspective as well. Mm -hmm. So, there are going to be certain instances where you have to shoot out of place. Mm -hmm. But for everything that you can, you want to find your natural point of alignment. So, if, if you're standing, you know how I teach the, the basics, is if you're standing with your feet like railroad tracks, right underneath your uh, un under your armpits, maybe, maybe shoulder width, and you're holding the gun across your body, or even if you just take a stick and put it between your legs, your gun is going to be pointing in your natural point of alignment. That's where your body wants to go to whenever you're looking or holding the gun. So we set our break points based on that natural point of alignment. For right-handed shooters, we want to be just to the left of our break point, because we have a lot more motion here. I'm going to stand up so I can show you too. There we go. When, when I'll grab my gun. Look at that. So when you have your gun and you're set up like this, hold on a second. My computer just went crazy on me. There we go. When you're standing here and you're holding the gun across you, this is your natural point of alignment. Yep. We have a lot more range of motion going this way than we do going this way, mm -hmm. right? So we want to make sure that, again, we're on the left side of a break point. So, so just say you're my break point, right, here. So my edge point of alignment needs to be here. So that way we have more range of motion to go to our right. And we're kind of allowing ourselves more freedom of movement. Now, for a left-handed shooter, if your break point is here, then you're going to set your natural point of alignment up here, just to the right of your break point. Again, towards the open side of your body. And with sporting clays... You know, hunting especially, you'll get out in the field and you have to shoot crossbody. And you just got to kind of do your best. Set yourself up. My thing is, is take your time, get your feet set as good as you possibly can. One, because it's safer. Mm -hmm. And safety to me is of utmost importance. Now, you don't want to fall over. Uh, it, it, even if you fire one shot, if you fall over and you throw the gun down and it goes off, you're looking at a dog hopefully not a person, mm -hmm. you know, any of that kind of stuff. So take the time, get your feet set. Don't rush because oftentimes you're going to try to rush because you're out of position and you're going to miss. Take the little bit extra time, the extra one, one and a half seconds. The bird's not going to get that much further away, but you'll have a lot better option of being able to hit the target or hit, hit the bird. You got time. Exactly. You do. People, people rush way too much. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, I mean, I help with guys that you might as well just take that first shell and just throw it on the ground. Yeah. I mean, it's just bang, you know, the, not even shoulder in the gun yet. Uh, Brain and stones his name. If anybody was wondering. <laughs> uh, so going back to uh, the actual gun, I mean, because obviously it, it, I can't be the only person to notice, but the barrel length, why the longer barrels? So I shoot 30 inch barrels and it's kind of right in the middle. But if you notice 
that, well, let me see if I can, I don't know if anybody will be able to see it or not, but my rib is carbon fiber. So this is the Beretta DT11 black. So I have, I have for years, I shot 28 inch barrels and that's all I ever shot. Mm -hmm. International skeet, everything is so fast that we have to mount with the gun starting down at our hip and we have to mount the gun to our shoulder. By the time when the target comes out, when we're pulling the trigger, it's less than a second. It's like three quarters of a second. And then we transition from one target to the next target. My second shot's like half a second mm -hmm. after that. Or I think it's 0. 0.6 seconds oh, after yeah. my first. You watch your, any so, of your YouTube videos. Yeah, you see how fast it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And with that, you need to have a light barrel in my, in my discipline. So in sporting clays, you can have a heavier gun. In trap, you definitely can. In American skeet, you can be a little bit heavier again, too, because the targets are slower. But there's definitely and there's something I want to get to with the heavier barrels and the lighter barrels. There's a big controversy between those two people. Anyways, I'm going to get to that one in a second. With this, I, when my 28-inch barrels, they, weigh, they weighed 1.31 kilos which I don't know what that relates to in pounds, but that's what was stamped on the barrels here because it's an Italian-made gun. That was one of the lighter barrels in the world at the time. Uh, to go to a 30-inch barrel, usually you're looking at at least 1.4, 1.42, 1.43. When they made the carbon fiber rib, this barrel now is 1.35, so I only gained 40 grams. and But I gained an extra two inches of sight picture Mm -hmm. which allowed me to condense the sight picture of the bird barrel relationship. And when you do that, again, it makes it easier. You have less room for error. So I tried it. I didn't know if I was going to like it or not, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. The more I shot it, the more that I liked it. And you know, I can't shoot 32 inch barrels. I've tried on sporting. And I, I originally started in sporting clays and then came to the international side. So I love sporting, but I have to shoot thirties for it because I shot 28 inch barrels for so long. And now getting to the argument of 30s and 32s, but heavy barrels versus light barrels. The argument is, is that the heavier the barrel, the more control you have of the gun. Yep. Really what happens is that you're now lacking control because the weight is oh, making you smooth, but it, takes the, your, it makes the inability for you to be able to go up and down and all these little micro movements that I call them. With the lighter barrels, I have complete control of every one of my movements. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is a lot of people don't like to be able to feel all of those, those micro movements. They want to feel smooth. And that makes them a little bit slower, a little bit smoother. You know, for mine, it's, it's slow is smooth and smooth is fast. But that's also one of the reasons why I think that I, I'm a little bit better shooting in the wind than a lot of people around the world is that I shoot probably one of the lightest guns barrel-wise in the world. And it allows me, if you're, I wish that people could see what I see when I'm looking down the barrel, because my barrel is constantly doing this and changing with the birds as they're flying through the air. And if you have that heavy barrel, you can't make those changes as fast. And that's why I like the light barrel versus the heavy barrel, because, yeah, it may be a lot harder to manage all those movements, but you have complete control over every movement that you make. Now, do you, do you see a difference between your hunting gun versus your competition gun for weight-wise? Uh, no, not really. I, mean, I shoot typically a 28-gauge or a 20-gauge. And, and the funny thing is is that oftentimes hunting guns are lighter than, than competition guns, right? Yep. And why is that? People always say, well, you know, it's, it's for carrying around uh, so you don't have to be worn out by carrying a heavy gun. Well, that's, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. But at the same time, you can make all those movements because the birds – like ducks, but they're moving, they're doing this. Mm -hmm. you know, how are you going to do that with a 10 pound gun? Yep. You can't, you have to have a lighter gun with a lighter movement, be able to move with that bird, with that target, wherever it goes. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry. I'm asking, I'm asking questions from my side. I got to get back to the audience here. This is great. I appreciate you sharing the information. This is awesome. All right. No so uh, do you have to change out your barrels off? And I, I'm not sure if that question is meaning replacing your barrels. I don't know if you can shoot out a shotgun barrel. Maybe you can, especially if you're shooting a thousand or a million rounds a, a year, but, or do, is it, it could even just be for your different situations. Do you change it out or is your barrel the barrel? That's it. My barrel is the barrel. I, I've, I've shot the, my DT 10 that I won my, both my Olympic medals with. 
Uh, it's it's still on still on the same gun. I mean that gun probably had a that barrel had about a half a million rounds through it at least, and it was never different. I mean I still have the same chokes in it from the very beginning. Actually I take that back. I did crack one, uh, one time that was a long time ago. But the bottom choke is still the same choke that it was from the day I started. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yep. All right. Here's a, a technical one. Explain the process from going to a low mount international to your shoulder for the shot. All right. That's going <laughs> to, hopefully y'all can see me when I stand up, but it's yep. much easier for me to show yep, as I've got you. my mask back here too. And I'll just show it. And you'll see the, the line on my vest is where the bottom of the gun has to start. It's a raggedy vest. I need a new one too, so don't make fun of it. Yeah, we All right. Know somebody. So we start with the gun about here. And I don't know if you'll be able to see much better than that, but I'll show you this way. One of the just the simplest thing that I can do is show you what, what my, one of my practice mounts looks like. It's not a fast practice mount, it's a slow and controlled. So what we're trying to do is what people call muscle memory. Yep. It's really building the myelin sheath around the myelin fiber, which dictates from the brain to the muscles what they need to do. So when you're doing that, the best thing to do is like an eccentric motion or a slow motion process through it all. So I'm just going to do a static. I'm going to pick a point. I'm going to put the end of my barrel, say the bead, on that point, and I'm going to pivot on that point, and the mount's going to last about five to six seconds. So I'm going to start here, and then it's going to come up very slowly. So right now you can also see that it's not back here. It's not underneath my, or under my, underneath my shoulder. It's out in front of my body. So now all it needs to do is just come straight up into my shoulder. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be an out, up, and then back in. That takes too much time. So I'm going to start here and then start counting. One, two, three, four, five, bang. So you can kind of see that slow motion. And with those mounts, the static mounts, I'll do you know, 30 of those. And then I'll do about you know, 35, 40 of the left to rights and 35 to 40 of the right to lefts. So that way I get, I get a good motion in on every aspect of the targets that I'm shooting at. And I can kind of show you one of the, the left to rights here. Starting here and then one, two, three, four, five there and a, a low house or a right to left is one two three four bang it's that slow motion process that helps but you can see that it starts in the front of the body and then just goes straight up yep. and we're trying to, we're trying to minimize as much time as you can because we just don't have enough of it to begin with mm -hmm. all right a few things um first one your elbow of your off arm I shouldn't even okay. say your off arm, so your trigger arm. That you got okay. Your, you got your hand on the, the trigger, the mm -hmm. sorry, the trigger grip, excuse me. So with that, now, you know, growing up and then even watching some videos and stuff, I mean, it's your wing, you know. Now, when you're shooting a rifle versus a shotgun, it's a little bit different, I believe. Uh, however, when I see it, it's it's almost planed, planed out. Is that mm -hmm. the proper? It's what's comfortable. That's the, that's yeah. the thing is I'm not, when it comes up, it's here. Yep. But I'm raising it and I'm not pushing it down. Yep. It's wherever that comes up and that, that elbow naturally falls. And it's going to be a little bit different for everybody, yep. but it's going to be pretty close to being the same. You know, it shouldn't be out straight and it definitely should not be above level. That's for sure. Okay. But you also have it tucked because if you have it tucked, what that does is it pushes the muscle, the chest muscle forward, that pec, mm -hmm. and then it pushes the gun forward and you don't want that because then it's going to reposition your shoulder or reposition your face on the gun. Yep. You want to have it natural comes up where it lines up, it opens up the pocket better, and that's where the gun sits. And another thing I want to note, too, for the audience out there is if you noticed, you know, Vincent's head and how much movement his head has had when he's shouldering that gun. And I shouldn't say how much, it's the lack of. Exactly. So that gun's and coming right up. the thing is move your gun to your head, not your head to your gun. Yep. It's very awesome. All right. Uh, another question, do you find a difference in your ammo brand, which I know you've, you're sponsored by Federal, so this is you know kind of a loaded question. I'm a big fan of Federal. I shoot a lot of Federal myself for, for upland bird hunting. Uh, do you find what works best for you for both practice and scoring? So are you shooting pretty much consistently anytime you're shooting that your, your skeet gun 
your competition gun is also your practice gun is also everything you take from overseas to the United States to wherever it might be. It's the same, everything. Exactly. Uh, everything is the same. Now, the one thing that is a struggle is sometimes we can't get ammunition overseas. So, I mean, I've shot all kinds of different ammo and I can definitely tell you that there's a big difference in brand to brand and there isn't the same shell. I mean, some people can't tell a difference. I can tell a difference in every single shell. Absolutely. And you know, it's, there's a lot of really good shells out there. Uh, I'm not going to, I won't knock anybody because it, they, there's a lot of good shells, but there is a reason why I, sh so I shot these shells. These are federal papers. So these are the gold medal grands that we shoot. And I shot these when I was in the army marksmanship unit for years and I loved them. I absolutely loved them. But team USA was sponsored by AA at the time with Winchester. And I shot for Winchester for a long time. Great shells there too. Great and I've won my Olympic medals. But there was always something about the federal paper. And my, my dad knew it. My dad was an all American trap shooter. My brother was an all American trap shooter. So growing up, it was always, if anybody was shooting federal papers, you went down there just so you could smell them. And then once I started shooting them, <laughs> I mean, you have that smell. It's like, Oh gosh, these things are awesome. Yep. And you can feel a difference too. And these things hit targets so hard that it's just, it looks like it's not even fair to everybody else. And you can, you can look at, we've got several different people of my athletes that shoot different shells mm -hmm. and you can tell which ones shoot federal. And then once the other ones switch over and like, say they, I let them shoot some of mine, they, every single time it never fails. They're like, wow, these hit targets so much harder and so much crisper and they kick less that I'm like, I want to shoot these. Mm -hmm. This is all I want to shoot. And unfortunately, you can't buy these shells, but uh, you know, Federal has some of the plastic calls out that you can shoot with the same load pretty much just in the plastic. Yep. And again, it's a great shell. It still breaks targets really, really hard, uh, just as hard as these really, but there's something different about shooting the paper. Yeah, I personally never shot too many paper targets. I mean, old school 410 shells when I was growing up, you know, I mean, but some of that new age stuff or – I think it was it RST makes some paper, paper shells too. Uh, Fioki does, Game Board does. Uh, you've got a few of them out there that do, but they're just few and far between. Yep. All right. So if you're having an off day, do you try to shoot your way out of it, or you just call it a day and go home? Don't shoot your way out of it. That's the worst thing that you can do. Now, some days I walk out and I'll shoot one box and I feel absolutely awful. Right. And, and when I was younger, I tried to shoot through it. And there's some good, there's some good things of trying to shoot through it too. I, I, I get that. Sometimes you should, sometimes, most of the time you shouldn't, but sometimes you should. But if I'm having a bad day, I'll walk out, I'll shoot one box. I'm just like, you know what, this, it's not even worth it. Cause all I'm going to do is get frustrated. I'm going to pick up some type of bad habit. I'm going to try to fix something that's really not broken. And I'm just going to move off of it. And, and to get a little bit more in detail with that, there is a thing called peak periodization. Most major athletes and sports track that and they watch it. And I track mine. There are periods of time throughout. Mine is a four week cycle. One week out of that four weeks, I will be down in comparison to the other three weeks. And I'll have two weeks where I'm really, really peaking. Mm -hmm. That third week, still shooting really well, but maybe not my absolute best. So you track that, you kind of figure out where that's at, what it's doing, what it looks like. And you go with it. If you're, if you're shooting really bad and it's been that off week, just go home. Don't, don't do anything bad to yourself. Well, it's, it's not worth like, Yeah. It's like bird hunting. I mean, some days you're on, some days you're not. And yeah, you know, I mean, I don't, I've never experienced those off days. I mean, I'm just such a good shot. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you're in the minority there then. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, total lie. All right. Uh, what aspects of a person's routine will improve their consistency? <sighs> Everything. And that's, that's why the pre-shot routine is so critical. Mm -hmm. you know, you, again, it's that repeatability that you're looking for. You want to be able to do the same thing every single time. So whether it be your feet are in the same spot or you're, you're making sure that you're using your hips and your knees to rotate your body versus using upper body and thoracic movements. All of that stuff comes into play. So that's why, you know, one, having a coach that is knowledgeable on what to do is really important. Mm -hmm. But 
also to be able to track and video yourself. I mean, take videos of yourself if you can. See what you're doing. And then you can go back and compare. You can contrast. You can say, okay, I was shooting really good this day, and everything felt like it was easy. So what did I look like? And I used to go back and watch videos of myself constantly competing overseas when I was shooting my best and say, okay, that's what I looked like there. That's what I need to look like now again. Because when you come back home, you go through periods of time, especially when I was a teenager, again, like we were just talking about, try to change things when something's not working. And then you get, you go, this is vicious cycle of going in and out of being able to do the right stuff. Whereas if you know what you're going to look like every time, then that, that cycle becomes a lot smaller and a lot less violent uh, and missing targets and everything else and violent on yourself, just you know, taking it out on yourself. Yep. So being able to condense down all the things that you're doing into a process and making sure that that process is the same every single time, it's really important. It doesn't need to be long. It doesn't need to be drawn out. You don't need to be doing any, any stuff that's like, you know, touching your hat here and here and here and this year, look like a baseball you know, sending signs out there. Yep. Just keep it simple. And that will be the best thing that you can do. That's great advice. And I got to gotta make sure I put this plug in there. Make sure everybody who's watching tonight, if you have not registered, uh, please make sure you go into shields.com slash hunt series for the prize drawing tonight. Again, we got some pretty cool prizes. We've got a phenomenal Beretta shotgun. I'm so excited for the people to win it, but I'm also so jealous about it. Um, I've got a, uh, a Beretta Onyx 20 gauge that I shoot. And I just love it. And this one's a, a silver pigeon, so it would be a nice addition to the family. However, uh, the winners are going to win that one, not me, the customers. All right, so back to it. We've got, looks like we got a couple minutes here. Uh, Vince, we got 10 minutes or so. So yeah. some of these questions aren't going to be as technical, uh, which I think is good also. I mean, you're a machine. I mean, you shoot so well. You know, let's, let's bring it down to a normal Nebraska boy or North Dakota boy's uh, level here. But ear protection, uh, mm -hmm. What, lube, we got shooter's lube being called out. Do you use frog lube? Do you use, what do you use for your, for your, your normal, if you open your range bag right now, what does Vincent have in his range bag? So I use mostly, I'll use the Q20 as my, as my oil. And that oil has saved my gun from being rusted. I don't know how many times. Mm -hmm. And because I mean, I've come back from a trip where I, I sprayed that down after a, after a competition, it was raining and whoever put my gun up because I had won a medal but it was it had water all over my gun and it was standing water I didn't take my gun out of my case for like a week I opened it up and it's just covered in water and there was no rust on it at all so that's I mean that, I, that made me a believer and now and I, I have no sponsorship by them I literally go and buy the stuff myself mm -hmm. and because I it has made a believer out of me and as far as my uh, grease goes I'm trying to think of the name of it I've got it in my bag. Hold on just a second. I can show you what it is. Because this stuff I swear by as well. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. It's an ancient, ancient tube. I've had this for like eight years. I just bought a new one. This one's running out. It's called a gun butter. Oh, yeah. And they've got some other stuff, you know, some different syringes and things like that. They're smaller. But that one, it just goes on my hinges. And on, on any of the pivot points, and just a little bit, it goes a long ways. That's why that thing still has some stuff left in it, because I just don't have to use that much. Well, and it's just a good example, because, I mean, how much you shoot, you know? Like, I'm one of the guys that, after every time I'm going, I mean, every weekend, you know, from a lot, anyways, um, I'm always cleaning my guns. I'm always making sure they're oiled. I'm always making sure they're lubed. Um, I, I shoot a, a different brand of shotgun you know, for a semi-automatic. I shoot a lot of Benelli's, and I just love the fact that you can take them apart so quick put them back mm -hmm. together so quick. But the nice thing about an over and under is it's, it's quicker. I mean, yep. and there's just less contact points you got to worry about. Um, all right. So going in, what was your first shotgun as a kid that got you started into the, the world? Of so my, the very first gun I shot was a Remington 1100. Nice. And there was one that my dad actually started with back in the late fifties, early sixties. And it was, so it was passed on to him from, from a family friend, I think, or an uncle or somebody. So it was only it would only fire one shot at a time. It would it wouldn't cycle, but then I switched to a new uh, 1100. This was when I was 10, mm -hmm. and pretty quickly thereafter, I went into a Beretta 390. Mm -hmm. uh, then went what was it from there to a Browning Satori, 
Sporting Clays edition. That was my dad's, actually. Then, to I tried a Parazzi for all of about three months. Couldn't shoot the thing. And then I went into a 682 Gold. Then a, a Breda 682 Gold. Yep. Then a 682 Gold E. And then I, I think I was 13 or 14 at that time. I think I was 13. And that's when Beretta came, uh, the president of, of Beretta USA at the time, uh, Chris Merritt, Christopher Merritt, he came down, was shooting at our range, our local gun club, saw me shooting, heard that I had just won the junior national championships and decided that he's like, hey, you know what? I'm going to send you down a DT-10. You, you go and shoot that and try it. And let me know how it goes. And I pulled that thing out of the box at, I think I was either 13 or 14, pulled it out of the box, shot a 98 out of 100 the first first day i looked at my dad i'm like this is my gun they're not they're not taking this away from me this is my gun buy it now that was the highest score i'd ever shot to that day too wow so that was my gun i shot that through the first two olympics switched to the dt11 and then now on the dt11 black and the grip on that gun i've never seen anything like that yeah it's a it's a special grip it's made by ergo sign they're out of germany uh so german engineering of course Oh yeah, I went to that stock because again of the room for error and getting my hand in the same spot every time on the grip. Mm. Because if you think about it, there's there's two aspects that are, are concerning for me on a traditional stock. One is the neck of the neck of the stock is you're going to put your hand close to the same spot every time, but if you move it up, mm-hmm. then your wrist is breaking over more, so you have less control and less strength through your wrist. And it also, the further up on the neck of it you hold, the further down it's going to get in your shoulder because you can't get it up without really raising your shoulder up to get there. It causes shoulder issues, wrist issues, all kinds of stuff. So when you push your hand down and try to get that wrist straight, typically your pinky is going to be hanging off the bottom of the stock. Yep. So a lot of people have little add-on wood pieces that they put on their bondo at the bottom of it to get their pinky to be in the right spot. So for me... This thing was available, and I, I was going to be in Germany. So I was like, you know what? Why don't I just get a custom grip? So it's it molded to my hand. It's got my finger grooves in it, my palm in it. It's even got the lines from my palm in it. <laughs> and so when my hand goes in there, and it's got it's kind of like a little glove stock, if you will. Yep. My hand goes in there the same spot every single time. It's gotta feel if it, it's a little bit off, one, I can feel it. But yep. two, it, you're talking millimeters. You're not talking about you know, a quarter of an inch. It, there's very little difference. And with that, again, always looking for repeatability. What can I do to minimize the error? Mm-hmm. And this allowed me to minimize that greatly. It's pretty cool. Way, way above my head. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, so what are your top three tips for a beginner? One thing is it's not a rifle or a pistol. Don't aim. You point a shotgun. Now, one of the things that I try to make sure that they do, and uh, you may have been able to see it when I was holding the gun earlier, is you hold the bottom of the forearm with these three fingers, you know, the middle finger, ring finger, and pinky. You take your pointer finger, point it down the side of the forearm, down the barrel, and you're essentially using the barrel as an extension of your finger. So now all you have to do is literally point and shoot. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, is it, it obviously takes lead to break a target. If it's, it's moving you know, yep. horizontally. And with that, you're going to have to be in front of it to be able to break it. So if you're missing a target and you don't know where you're missing it at, go ahead and add more. Because nine times out of ten, you're missing behind. you got a shot string coming too. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's there for basically two rotations of a target, like one and a half rotations. So it's not like it's, it's there for very long. But you have more of a likelihood of hitting that target in front than you do at the back. You have zero chance of hitting it from behind. Mm -hmm. At least if you're in front, you might have some flyers or the very tail end of that pattern being able to to just put enough on it to make it crack or to get a couple pieces off of it. Mm -hmm. And so for my third, I would have to say get a gun that actually fits and shoot the shells. This is going to be kind of a two-in-one. Get shells that are worth shooting, meaning don't get ones that are going to just knock you silly. Find something that you can manage the recoil with that's not going to make you start flinching. You know, if you can, start with 7-8 ounce loads. 
light loads. They're not, they're, they're a little bit cheaper typically, usually, mm -hmm. and you're going to have a lot better response to the gun as well, but you need to have a gun that fits. Try out all of them. It doesn't, doesn't have to be Beretta. I know I'm a Beretta guy. They fit me perfectly, but whether it be Browning, Beretta, Parazzi, Kregoff, Blauser, it doesn't matter. Find whatever works for you and fits you. So when you, if you close your eyes and you mount the gun, you have it comfortable, you open your eyes back up again, your eye should be pointing right down the middle of the barrel. Mm -hmm. If it's not, then you might have to make some slight adjustments. And it's not, some gun or some people, you're not going to have a gun that truly fits you without making some modifications. But get one that fits you as close as possible, feels good in your hands, and then make the modifications from there. That's great advice. All right, last question. And then we're going to announce the big winner. What superstitions, if you're willing to share any, what superstitions do you have? Well, I try to stay as far away from superstitions as possible. Smart man. So you make your own luck. I don't, I don't believe in any of that kind of stuff. I try not to, at least. But I will say that for a long time, I used to have to, like, whenever I got somewhere and I was shooting good, whatever I was eating, I'm like, you know what? That's working. I'm just going to eat that <laughs> same meal every single night of the competition. And, and now again, as I've gotten older, I'm like, that's, that doesn't have anything to do with it. I, you know, I need to, I, I watch what I eat. Everything that I eat goes into an, an app on my phone. So I'm making sure I'm tracking my, my calories, my carbs, my fats, my proteins, all that kind of stuff. And as long as I'm eating the right things and healthy things then I know I'm going to be okay, my body's going to react the way that it needs to react mm -hmm. and then I'm good. But outside of that, no, it's just, I guess if I had a superstition, it's doing the same thing every time on the stations. I got lucky underwear. I ain't afraid to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Just kidding. All right. So the winner tonight, um, $2,500 in gear, which is incredible. I uh, want to definitely appreciate and, and give some love to Brett on this. They, they donated a 686 Silver Pigeon, which is a fantastic shotgun, an all-around trap thrower, and a whole bunch of Shields Outfitter gear. So the winner tonight is from Wisconsin. I think this is the first Wisconsin winner we've had is Dan O from Ripon, Wisconsin. R I P O N is the name of the town. If I hopefully pronounce that correctly, Ripon, Ripon, Wisconsin. Sorry, we got a technical Wisconsin guy back here. All right, so congratulations. Uh, make sure everybody, uh, if you guys have got any further questions, I'm sure um, Vince that you've got something out there as well. I'm sure you're on social media. Um, I just cannot thank you enough. Uh, there's a lot of secrets. There's a lot of information in there. I know I'm going to go back and listen to this again. Uh, that muscle memory deal is no joke. I mean, I sometimes I feel like a nerd and I get judged because I'm doing that same thing in the in the living room of my house, you know, and following the lines and, you know, closing the eyes, shouldering the shotgun, looking to see where it's at. But I'll tell you what, I mean, for me as being a bird hunter, there's something about, you know, being able to reward my dogs, hopefully with a, a rough grouse or a pheasant or a quail or something like that. But definitely appreciate your time. Uh, I know you didn't have to do this, and the information you shared was very, very valuable. And uh, we got a virtual fishing series coming up later on this month. So please make sure you guys are following uh, social media on Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram. And just want to thank everybody. And Vincent, again, thank you so much for your time tonight. And best thank of luck to coming competitions. Thank you. Thank you.